Hi, Jeff Disher here again. Uh, today I'm going to do kind of a, a brief overview of the whole topic of malware, software that can be harmful or, or other things that can actually harm you or your data uh, kind of on the internet or on your home computer. And uh, this is going to be just very brief because it's a very large a very large area. I'm just going to try and touch on a bunch of issues and that'll be it. So we're going to go through viruses, which is sort of the, the traditional one everyone knows about. A related and more modern idea called a worm. Uh, something called ransomware, which is kind of a, a growing threat these days. Scareware, which is a similar kind of idea in that it's a, it's a growing problem now. Um, and then we're going to talk about kind of the, the basic background that underlies a lot of how the, the most damage or most exploitation of software and, and digital content is actually done, which is traditionally through social engineering. Uh, it, just, it just happens on a narrower scale, but it's usually more successful. Uh, a really interesting idea called, called a white hat. And then some basic kind of run through of some protection possibilities you have for these kinds of things and the, the good and bad about those. So a virus is kind of the thing everyone knows about. It's, it's a, a well understood concept within our culture. Now, how this works is it actually infects the program or your operating system. Now, what does that mean? Well, it actually injects its own code into the target program, much like how a virus will actually go into a cell and use its replication mechanisms to uh, actually create more of itself to replicate. So this means that the program, once it's been infected with the virus, if it's actually run, that's when the virus code gets to run. And at that time, it'll do something like replicate, typically, uh, to find other programs to infect, or it'll perform some nefarious task that it was designed to perform, something like that. Now, antivirus software is, of course, kind of a a well-known solution to this problem. And how this works is it actually goes through the programs and it tries to find and remove these these kind of signatures, what they call them. Usually it's just the pattern of what the virus code looks like. Now you can't find these in general. You actually always have to know what they are, um, which is why things like antivirus definition files have to be updated all the time because new viruses come out. Also, the viruses themselves might be encrypted or they, they might kind of mutate themselves. Now these are specifically approaches taken by certain more modern viruses to try and evade detection. Uh, now, they don't change what it actually does, they just change what it looks like, so it makes it harder to find, because the antivirus is limited to seeing what it expects the virus to look like. It's not obvious that, oh, this program's infected because of its behavior. It can't tell if that's what it's supposed to do or not. So, and there's other, there's other ways to counter that we'll talk about in, in protection as well. Now, worms, these are, these are kind of more of a modern concept. They became a big issue about 10 or 15 years ago uh, with things like buffer overflow, uh, bugs in web servers um, and some related SQL injection attacks in databases, things like that. Now these actually replicate without changing the infected program. Now this means the metaphor again works similarly to how it works in uh, parasites actually infecting you or something or, or another large organism. Um, something like a worm getting into that. They don't necessarily uh, they're kind of attached to its life cycle, but they don't necessarily damage it, which is kind of an interesting thing about worms. Um, they often just use the capabilities of the host program to do something else. Uh, they usually don't damage it. Often these get in using ex by exploiting security holes, um, like I mentioned with some of the buffer overflows and stuff. Uh, this is why this is less of an issue these days, because a lot of these holes just get fixed over time, and there's less new things coming out as opposed to fixes to existing things. Uh, this means that they replicate while the infected program itself is running. Now this is interesting because it's not every time you start it, it gets to replicate, it's while it's running since being infected. So this is different because it means restarting the program usually will remove the worm. Usually it's attached to the running state of the program. So if the program dies, uh, the worm dies too. Now that means it can be reinfected later, but um, that's kind of a simple way around this. Usually they're sort of very temporary kind of infections. That's why you see them in long-running server software. Now, ransomware, this is a, a very new concept, and it's really kind of terrifying. Um, now, this is not actually an infection vector. It's not how something goes wrong. It is what's wrong. It's the payload itself, the, the damaging thing, which means it comes in as part of a, a virus or, or a Trojan horse, which is something I'll mention a bit about later. Um, something like that that actually makes you do something unsafe. Now what these do is they typically restrict access to programs or data on your system. Um, and of course this could apply as well to online data or something like that as long as it gets access to it, uh, which can happen for many reasons. So 
this is becoming a growing problem, and it's not one going away, because as we move the data around, it's, we're just moving the ransomware around too. Uh, so what this often does, usually it picks on your data, because the data is going to be valuable. Remember, if the program gets damaged or infected, you can just replace it. Right? Worst case scenario, you just buy another copy. Uh, but the data is unique. Unless you have backups, you really need it. Now, having backups often protects you from ransomware. So usually what it does is it'll encrypt this. So this is why it's so dangerous. It's not like a virus that you can remove after you've been infected. Once your data has been encrypted, you can't decrypt it. You require the ransomware decryption key, which they only give you if you pay them a ransom. So usually this is something like, you know, it'll, it'll infect your system, encrypt some of your files, and it'll tell you, you know, we've encrypted X many files on your system. If you ever want to see your data again, send some amount of money to, you know, this, this online, whatever. Uh, however they're managing it. And then they claim they'll decrypt it if you pay them. Of course, whether or not that actually happens is up to them. Because remember, they have all the power in this case. Now, really the only way to protect yourself from this is by avoiding the initial infection. Uh, this is why this doesn't happen too often. Usually just by applying some, by being careful and... By, by understanding what's going on around you and what things mean, and also making sure your software uh, that you're using to access things, like your web browser, operating system, stuff like that, uh, doesn't have any, any open security holes left behind, that, that they could kind of be uh, diligent about updating those, uh, then it's usually not that big a deal, but it can be a huge problem if you get it. Uh, it's always a big worry. And again, backups often protect you too, because you can just back up to a version before they encrypted it. So Scareware, now this is kind of the other side of it. It's not the, really the payload, it's the infection vector. Usually what it does is it scares the user into taking some unsafe action. It'll actually start, it'll be something like uh, a web page that says, oh, you, you know, throws up a banner saying, uh, your system has a bunch of viruses on it we've detected. You have to download this thing and run it to protect yourself right now. Well, okay, the web page doesn't know that. All it's trying to do is scare you into doing something it wants. So. This is something you see a lot of these days because of there's, it's easier to kind of mass market the scareware this way. You can just put it all over the place and someone will take it by accident or because they're unsure of something, they were scared. Uh, but it really exploits kind of the, a lot of the, the problems surrounding the ignorance of what the software actually does. So I think by making people understand a little bit more about what's going on, they'll be safer. So this generally means it's just an infection vector. Now, if you identify that's what it is, you, you see this banner come up and you kind of chuckle at it and go, yeah, right, the web page I'm looking at knows this. Nah, I know what you're doing. And you close it. You can ignore it because it's not a real thing. It's just trying to scare you. But it can be a concern if you don't know that. So it's really about exploiting ignorance or feel, fear or cultural blackmail. A lot of times they'll do something like uh, in kind of the, the seedier areas of the internet, these things will come up and say like, oh, you don't want people to know that you're here. Well, we'll tell them unless you do whatever. Again, it's just another scare tactic. If you ignore it, or if you kind of uh, can't be hurt by those things because you don't legitimize them, things like that, you're, you'll be safe. So it, it's about having a bit of knowledge and confidence and kind of being aware of what's going on and not being easily scared by someone trying to talk over your head or trying to fast talk you into something that uh, you don't want to be doing. So it's important you know what your what the implications of your actions will be. Now social engineering is really how this all started. Now most malware that's been really successful has been about exploiting the user, not the software. Because remember, humans are limited. We, we trust certain things about our environment. There's certain things we know, certain things we don't know. And so we have sort of certain rituals around how to do certain things. So if someone plays along with us, if they know how the ritual works, but they understand everything around it too, they can actually uh, engineer us into doing things they want. And this is historically how kind of the, the larger exploits have worked. Uh, they're usually not technical. It's usually about that. A good example is uh, Kevin Mitnick, who was, who was very successful at this a long time ago uh, and ended up in jail for quite a while because of it. Uh, nowadays, he's a security consultant, of course, which, which is kind of the path that a lot of people going down that road end up taking. Um, but it's interesting because if you look at a lot of what he did, it was mostly about social engineering. It requires understanding how all the, all the, the kind of technical aspects work, but that's not how you're going in. That's just how you speak confidently to get someone to trust you, and then you exploit that trust. So this is, again, the Trojan horse idea, which I've kind of mentioned before. It's something that looks safe but contains malicious software. That's another one of those things. It's either going to be the, oh, you need to download this thing because 
uh, it'll protect you from viruses or whatever. It's a magic rock that keeps tigers away, something like that. And you take this and you run it thinking, ah, this is going to do what I want, and it actually does something bad. And this is how it gets in, because a Trojan horse looks harmless, but it's containing something deadly. So again, the metaphor works really well. Now, fishing. This is sort of a, this is an issue which is much, much bigger than anyone wants to give credit to, and it's probably going to get worse over time, because um, people are going to blindly trusting larger and larger authorities instead of actually understanding what's going on directly. So this can become a big issue. Remember, this is all about masquerading as someone who's trusted to get information. For example, what if you go to a website and it says, oh, log in with your Gmail account. You click that button, it takes you to a login panel, put in your username and password, and now they've got access to your Gmail account and everything that Google has connected to it. Because, well, you, did you check that that was actually the right page? Maybe it was just a page that gave you to look like that. I've seen this happen before too. You get emails all the time saying, pretending to be from your bank, telling you, oh, you need to log in here to uh, change your password or something. And you check what the link is, it's not your bank's page. <laughs> They're just making it look like it. Because if you give them your credentials, they can use that too. So those things are really big concerns. People need to be really aware of it because there's nothing technical to protect you because it's not a technical problem. Some of the easy ways around, like there's some basic low hanging fruit that's already been used by browsers to try and make it easier for you to notice when that's happening. Uh, but you need to be aware of it because it's still something that it all comes down to. You need to know who you're talking to. So a white hat, now this is really kind of an interesting idea. Now, in sort of the, the sort of hacker culture, there's, there's the idea of a black hat, which is someone who actually exploits systems uh, to harm them, like to, for, for some personal gain reasons, um, or, or even basic prestige within certain communities, things like that. Now, the opposite of that is a white hat, someone who does the same things, but defensively. They're usually trying to understand, uh, they, they find an exploit either by accident or out of curiosity or something like that. And they're usually the people who will tell you, by the way, I found this bug in your software. You really need to fix it. Someone could do this, this, and this. Here's exactly how they would do it. And they try and help you through it. The best these people want is yeah, maybe a job, um, maybe just the, the praise of, yeah, this guy really helped us out. Um, so it's kind of neat because there's these people who use their, you know, use their powers for good or evil, right? It's, it's kind of neat that way. So basically they come down to being a whistleblower. They're trying to point out something's wrong. Now the problem, this ends up meaning they, they often demonstrate the exploit to show the problem, not actually demonstrating it to exploit it. Usually they're trying to help you. This, is, this means this area is legally ambiguous, because remember, they are actually exploiting something, and usually going against what you're doing. Um, so sometimes people actually, sometimes it's easier for, for certain organizations to save face by kind of shooting the messenger. So instead of acknowledging that there was a problem, they say, no, no, this person caused all the problems, and they blame it all on that. So it's a dangerous issue, but it's, it's kind of a neat area where, where there's different ways of, of using that knowledge. So how do you protect yourself against some of these threats? Well, there's a bunch of things. First of all, we all know antivirus software. That actually does a fairly good job of detecting viruses. But remember, only the ones that it knows. I need to trust your antivirus software. Don't just download some random thing from the internet. It might be a virus. So you need to be aware of that. But those are useful tools. Again, not being a target can help too. Views like you know, Mac or Linux, you're going to be less of a target than Windows, but these problems can still exist. Security holes, again, they, they just need to be patched quickly. Now, usually your, your, your operating system will do a good job of telling you that. Um, I know, for example, on Ubuntu Linux, it actually tells you specifically, oh, there's this many updates available. By the way, this many of them are security only. And the reason is you might not want to update for some bug fix someone has because maybe you don't care or maybe it works fine for you or something like that or you don't use it. But security holes can actually be a real problem even if you're not actively engaged in them, depending on what they are. So you need to make sure those are patched quickly. The other main thing is run as a non-admin user. Now, what do I mean by that? Well, non-admin is going to be someone who can't change the software on the system. Um, they can only change their own data. They can use the software on the system, but they can't install things. They can't change the core parts of the system. This means that if, say, a virus gets in and tries to infect those files, it can't because the virus is going to be running as you. You don't have access to those files. You can't change them. The OS itself protects you at that level. So it's really solid that way. Plus, if you have multiple users who share the system and they all have their own user accounts, 
one of them getting exploited does not affect the others. So this is a this is a really good kind of basic to keep in mind. And it helps for many, many reasons. Something else you're seeing these days in things like iOS or Android or something like that is software which uses cryptographic signatures. Now what this means is it's actually, there's going to be a signature of what the program looks like. Now if the program changes, the signature is going to change, which means it won't match, so the OS will refuse to run it. This protects you against things like viruses. However, more often than not, it's it's really about keeping control of the platform uh, under whoever, whatever company is actually controlling it um, or, or selling it. So this is, this is, unfortunately, it could be a useful thing, but it's usually used for, for more control purposes than protection, unfortunately. And again, the, the main thing everyone needs to remember is what can protect you against most of these things is knowledge. You have to remember, the computer isn't magic. Everything there, it actually has a certain function, it behaves a certain way. Um, having a little bit of knowledge in how that works can protect you from most or all of these things. So it's important to kind of know what's going on around you. Remember, if you use the computer all the time, it doesn't make sense for you to say, oh, I don't want to understand how it works. You should. It's, it's part of your day-to-day -day life. It's becoming really, really important to you. It's how you access your world. You should probably know a little bit about it. There's no, mag there's no magic silver bullet here. It's just knowledge. So, I, and again, that's, what I, that's why I'm putting these out. I want people to understand this stuff because it, it's interesting and, and there's lots to know and there's lots to talk about. So, Anyway, in case you have any questions, please post them here. I know this was this didn't go into great detail about most of those, but it's a very large area of discussion. Um, but I hope this was helpful, and let me know if you have any questions or comments or anything else you want me to talk about. Thanks. Bye.